about God, you wrote, God talks to human beings through many vectors, wise people, organized religion, the great books of religions, through art, music, and poetry. But nowhere was such detail and grace and joy as through creation. When we destroy nature, we diminish our capacity to sense the divine. What is your relationship and uh, what is your understanding of God? Who is God? Well, I mean, God <laughs> is incomprehensible. You know, I mean, I guess the, 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 most philosophers would say we're, you know, we're inside the mind of God. Um, and so it would be impossible for us to understand, you know, what actually what, you know, what God's form is. Or, um, but I mean, for me, I have a, um, let's say this, I had, when I was, I was raised in a very, very deeply religious setting. So we went to um, church in the summer, oftentimes twice a day, the morning mass. And we went to, we definitely went every Sunday. And we, um, and I went, we prayed in the morning, we prayed before and after every meal. We prayed at night, we said a rosary, sometimes three rosaries a night. And my father read us the Bible. Um, when, whenever he was home, he would read us, you know, we'd all get in the bed and he'd read us the Bible stories. Oh, I, and I went to Catholic schools. I went to Jesuit schools. I went to the nuns. Um, and I went to a Quaker school at one point. Um, when I, I became a drug addict when I was about 15 years old, about a year after my dad died. And I was addicted to drugs for 14 years. During that time, when you're an addict, you're living against conscience. And when you're living, and I never, you know, I, I was always trying to get off of drugs, never able to, but I never uh, felt good about what I was doing. And um, and when you're living against conscience, you kind of push God to the per peripheries of your life. Oh, so, uh, I'll call me he. Gets it recedes and gets smaller. Um, and then when I um. When I got sober, I knew that I had a couple of experiences. One is that I had a, a friend of my brother's, one of my brothers who died of this disease of addiction, um, had a good friend who had used to take drugs with us. And he became a Mooney. So he he became a follower of Reverend South, Sun Young Moon. And he's at that point, his compulsion, he had the same kind of compulsion that I had, and yet it was completely removed from him. And so, and he used to come and hang out with us, but he would not want to take drugs, even if I was taken right in front of him. He was, uh, he was immune to it. He'd become impervious to that uh, impulse. And um, I, when I was in the, when I first got sober, I was, I knew that I did not want to be the kind of person who was, you know, waking up every day in white knuckling sobriety and just, you know, trying to resist, resist through willpower. And by the way, I had, um, I had iron willpower as a kid. I gave up candy for Lent when I was 12 and I didn't eat it again until I was in college. I gave up, um, I gave up desserts the next year for Lent, and I didn't ever eat another dessert till I was in college. And I was trying to bulk up for rugby and for sports, so um, I felt like I could do anything with my willpower. But somehow, this particular thing—you know—the the addiction was completely impervious to it, and I, it was cunning, baffling, baffling, incomprehensible. I could not understand why I couldn't just say no and then never do it again like I did with everything else. Um, and um, so I was living against conscience and I and I, I thought about this guy and I you know reflecting my own prejudices at that time in my life I was I said to myself I didn't want to be I didn't want to be like a drug addict who was wanting a drug all the time and just not being able to do it I wanted to completely realign my my myself so that I was somebody who got up every day and just didn't want to take drugs, never thought of them, you know, kissed the wife and children and went to work and was never thought about drugs the whole day. And I knew that 
people throughout history had done that. You know, I'd read the lives of the saints. I knew St. Augustine had had a very, very dissolute youth and, and, you know, had this spiritual realignment transformation. I knew the same thing had happened to St. Paul, you know, at Damascus. The same thing had happened to St. Francis. St. Francis also had a had a dissolute and fun-loving youth and, and had, you know, had this this deep spiritual realignment. And I, I knew that that had happened to people throughout history. And I thought that's what I needed, you know, something like that. I had the example of this friend of mine, and I used to think about him, and I would think, and this, again, reflects the, the bias and the, you know, probably the meanness of myself at that time, but I, I said, I'd rather be dead than be a Mooney. But I wish I somehow could distill that power that he got without becoming a religious nuisance. And um, and at that time, I picked up a book um, by Carl Jung called Synchronicity. And Jung, he was a psychiatrist, he was a contemporary of Freud's. He was a, um, Freud was his mentor, and, and Freud wanted him to be his replacement, but Freud was an avowed atheist. And Jung was a deeply spiritual man. He had these very intense and genuine spiritual experiences from when he was a little boy, from when he was three years old, that he remembers. His biography is fascinating about him because he remembers them with such detail. And um, he uh, he was he had written. He was always he was interesting to me because he was a very faithful scientist, and I considered myself a science based person from when I was little. And yet he had this spiritual dimension to him which infused all of his thinking and really, I think, made him, you know, it is the, it branded his, his form of, of recovery or of, um, of treatment. And he thought that he had this experiment, experience that he describes in this book where he's sitting up on the third, he ran one of the biggest sanitariums in Europe, in Zurich. And he was sitting up on the third floor of this building. And he's, talking to a patient who had a, who was talking describing her dream to him and the fulcrum of that dream was a scarab beetle which was a, an insect that is not is very very uncommon if at all in northern europe but it's a common figure in the iconography of uh, of egypt and the hieroglyphics on the on the walls of the pyramids etc and um he and he, while he was talking to her, he heard this bing, bing, bing on the window behind him. And he didn't want to turn around to take his attention off her, but finally he does it. He, he, in exasperation, he turns around, he throws up the window, and a scarab beetle flies in and lands in his head. And he shows it to the woman, and he says, is this what you were thinking of? Is this what you were dreaming about? And he, he was struck by that experience, experience, which was similar to other experiences he's had like that. And that's what synchronicity means. It's a... It's a, a an incident, a coincidence, you know. And like if some, if you're if you're talking with somebody about somebody that you haven't thought about in twenty years, and that person calls on the phone, that's synchronicity. Oh, and he believed it was a way that God intervened in our lives that broke all the all the rules of nature that He had set up, the rules of physics, the rules of mathematics, or you know to reach in and sort of tap us on the shoulder and say, I'm here. And um, and so he tried to reproduce that in a clinical setting. And he would put one guy in one room and another guy in another room and have them flip cards and, and guess what the other guy had flipped. And he believed that if he could beat the laws of chance, laws of mathematics, that he would approve the existence of, a, of, an, of an unnatural law, a supernatural law. And that was the first step to proving the existence of a god. He never succeeds in doing it, but he says in the book, um, even though I can't prove using empirical and scientific tools the existence of a God, I can show through anecdotal evidence, having seen thousands of patients come through this institution, that people who believe in God get better faster and that the recovery is more enduring than people who don't. And for me, hearing that was more impactful than if he had claimed that he had proved the existence of a God because I wouldn't have believed that. But I I was already at a mindset where I would have done anything I could to improve my chances of never having to take drugs again by even 1%. And if believing in God was going to help me, whether there's a God up there or not, 
believing in one itself had the power to help me, I was going to do that. So then the question is, how do you start believing in something that you can't see or smell or hear or touch or taste or acquire with your senses? And Jung provides the formula for that. And he says, he says, act as if you fake it till you make it. And so that's, you know, what I started doing. I just started pretending there was a God watching me all the time and kind of life was a series of tests and each there was a bunch of moral decisions that I had to make every day and each one you know these were all just little things that I did but each one now for me had a moral dimension like when I um, you know when the alarm goes off do I lay in bed for an extra 10 minutes with my indolent thoughts or do I jump right out of bed do I have, do I make my bed most important decision of the day do I hang up the towels you know do do I um do I, when I go into the closet and pull out my blue jeans and a bunch of those wire hangers fall on the ground, do I shut the door and say, I'm too much, I'm too important to do that, that's somebody else's job or not? And so, uh, do I put the water in the ice tray before I put it in the freezer? Do I put the shopping cart back in the, you know, place that it's supposed to go in the parking lot of, of the Safeway? And if I make a whole bunch of those choices right, that um, I maintain myself in a posture of surrender, which keeps me open to the power of, to my higher power, to my, to my God. And when, the, when I do those things right, um, when I, you know, so much about addiction is about abuse of power, you know, abuse of, all of us have some power, whether it's, our, you know, good looks or whether it's, uh, you know, connections or education or, or family or whatever. And there's always a, temp a, a temptation to use those to fill, fulfill self-will. And the challenge is how do you use those always to serve instead God's will and, the, you know, the, the good of our community. And that, uh, to me, is you know, kind of the struggle. And when I do that, I feel... I feel God's power coming through me and that I can do things. I'm much more effective as a human being. That that gnawing, you know, uh, anxiety that I lived with for so many years and my God, that I, it's gone. And that um, I can kind of like put down the oars and hoist the sail and, you know, and the wind takes me and I can, I can see the evidence of it in my life. And, you know, the big thing, for, you know, for, to temptation for me is that um, when all these good things start happening in my life and the cash and prizes start flowing in, you know, how do I maintain that posture of surrender? How do I stay surrendered then when I'm, my inclination is to say to God, thanks, God, I got it from here, <laughs> yeah, and drive the car off the cliff again? And uh so, you know, I had a spiritual awakening and my desire for drugs and alcohol was lifted miraculously. Uh, and it, to me, it was as much a miracle as if I had, if I'd been able to walk on water. Because I had tried everything earnestly, sincerely, and honestly for a, a decade to try to stop. And I could not do it under my own power. And then all of a sudden it was lifted effortlessly. And, um, you know, so I saw that evidence uh, early evidence of God in my life and, um, and of the power. And um, and I see it now, you know, every day of my life. So adding that moral dimension to all of your actions is how you were able to win that uh, Camus battle against the absurd. Uh, <laughs> exactly. With the bold it's all the same thing. It's the battle to just to do the right thing. And now Sisyphus was able to find somehow happiness. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, Bobby, thank you for the stroll through some of the most important moments in in recent human history and for running for president. And um, thank you for talking today. Thank you, Lex.